Okay, everyone, welcome back to another episode of The Pursuit of Ownership. Um, it's me and Tyler here. We're just doing a little intro for an uh, episode we just recorded. Um, it's a D4 student that has found a decent practice. So, Tyler, what were your thoughts? Yeah, you know, I, I got to say that, you know, I know we've had a lot of students on here before. And maybe the idea of having a young, precocious like dental student on here that's interested in practice ownership is not quite as novel as it used to be. Um, but for me, especially during these kinds of times, uh, it's really exciting when you see someone that's still really thrilled about getting into practice ownership early. Um, not necessarily right out of school like this guy is, which is awesome. Um, but just to, just to see that they kind of have their mindset on that, because like I'm seeing it myself in my own classmates where... And, and this is not a front to them at all, but, uh, you know, they're kind of buying out, I guess, on, on some of the goals that they had because of a lot of the things that have happened, um, because they've missed out on clinical experiences because, um, they just don't feel like they're going to be as ready as if they were going to feel ready before. Um, and you know, there's a lot of skepticism on, uh, you know, on Facebook and among professors that I hear about, you know, they're talking about us not being so prepared and you know, there's all these kind of questions about the boards. Like it's a really, really crazy time to be considering what happens after graduation when you're not even totally sure you're going to graduate sometimes. Right. So, um, I was just really happy to see a D4 that, you know, had that kind of clarity and, um, you know, it was just kind of ready to send it. Yeah. He's, he's still going to send it. Yeah. He's um, still going to send it. Yeah. Yeah. I, 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 yeah. I definitely thought it was really cool. Um, being around, you know, all the people at school that kind of have the, the victim mindset, um, mm -hmm. they're kind of just looking at like, oh my gosh, like what's, look at all this stuff that's happening to me. Um, yeah. I think it's really refreshing to talk to someone that kind of is looking at it as like, okay, what can I do to make this the best thing possible? And I like how he's still really yeah. actively searching for practices, still talking to brokers, yeah. um, considering a mail if doesn't go through. Uh, I just really appreciate that he's still being extremely proactive given mm -hmm. the overwhelming negativity that's in, um, just in the dental field right now. Yeah, I mean, I think it's important that, you know, he's really doubling down on what he wants to do. And the how has changed a little bit, right? Because like, it's not as straightforward as it was before. Um, the hows have become complicated because you're like, oh, man, I don't know how I'm going to get my experiences done. I don't know how boards is going to turn out. I don't know um, how I'm going to be received when I'm looking for a practice or, you know, what are brokers going to tell me? What are seller dentists going to think about me having lost all this experience? Um, but there, with with Morty in particular, you know, there's less concentration on the how and more just like what, like I'm looking for this practice. I'm going to purchase it after school. Like he's still focusing on that plan. And I think one, one of the most common ways that we seem to buy ourselves out of things is we think a little bit too much about the how, like, obviously that's where all the problems are. And it's sort of what you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And you're always trying to figure out and use your critical thinking. And, you know, you're, you're trying to find workarounds for obstacles that come in the way, but you know, ultimately the what and the why don't really need to change just because circumstances arise um, like the one that's happening here. And I, I'm glad you mentioned victim mentality because it's so easy to get into that right now, right? Because none of this is in your control. I mean, you, you can't. I mean, this came out of absolutely nowhere. There was no way to prepare for it. You know, I mean, the common person just had no clue and you didn't really know what it was going to look like. I mean, I, I personally, I remember freaking out because I didn't think I was, I thought I was going to lose like two weeks of clinic. And I was like, oh my God, two weeks? Like, what am I going to do without two weeks of clinic? And then I'm coming back in like late June, I'm working on mannequins again. I mean, you know, it's been a rough time to be a dental student, especially when you have sort of lofty goals already and, and are concerned that you're going to be underprepared when you get out. So, um, you know, a lot of respect for this guy for, for just going for it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that, uh, I think that oh, kind of sets the scene nicely. So uh, let's get into it. Yeah, for sure. Hope you guys enjoy it. All right, everyone, welcome back to another episode of The Pursuit of Ownership. It is Peyton Keller here, and I'm here with Tyler as always. Tyler, how you doing? Yes, sir. I am doing quite well. It's uh, it's good to be back here with you and uh, a, a very new uh, guest here that I am excited to have on. He's one of the uh, younger fellows that we've had on the show here, and so I'm really excited um, for him to kind of inspire some of our younger audience to, to some greatness. So I uh, really want to get into the story. Absolutely. Yeah. It's uh, definitely inspiring to get people that are still in school and already have made so mm -hmm. many connections or have, you know, an opportunity already open. So that's kind of what we're going to go into a little bit today. So um, a real guest, fake name, what uh, what's going to be your nickname for today? 
So my fake name is going to be Morty. I love watching Rick and Morty, so I don't think you guys have Morty yet. So. Yeah, I am. Uh, I'm pretty impressed with that name. Actually, I was kind of expecting like a superhero or something. Um, but you know, pulling something out of Cartoon Network that's uh, that that gets points for me or Adult Swim, I guess rather. Um, so I, I was really happy to hear that. So I appreciate it. Ah, uh, thanks. Yeah, I feel like yeah. the more the more unexpected, the better. Honestly, yeah. So that's that's perfectly spot on. Well, now you guys get more crazy names. <laughs> <laughs> yeah for sure well I, I hopefully people will kind of keep raising the bar on that um so yeah morty so tell us a little bit about yourself and and where you're coming from and what brought you to us so i'm a fourth year uh, dental student right now i've been listening to the podcast for quite a while ever since i started dental school and Fantastic. i think like most people that listen to the podcast i've been inspired to pursue ownership as soon as possible and in my head i've always had this plan that I was going to own right when I get out and everything. But now with the whole COVID thing happening and coming in out of nowhere, uh, we've had our clinic experience cut in half, especially in our fourth year. We've had four months off and now we're only utilizing 40% of clinic time. Right. So that's kind of discouraged me a little bit, but I'm, I'm still trying to see if I can find an opportunity. Hopefully I found this practice and hopefully we'll dig up into it and we'll see if it's a good opportunity or not. Yeah, yeah I know. Sure. Tyler and I have both been experiencing that same thing too with just clinic not being open to full capacity or them being hesitant to fill all the chairs. So um, it's nice to see that you're still looking ahead and still looking to move forward. I know that for a lot of people that might scare them away and might push them towards, you know, doing an associateship or doing, uh, you know, some sort of residency. So I, I think it's great that you're still trying to pursue that goal that you set for yourself. I am, but uh, just to be clear, I'm still on the fence, so I'm still trying to get see if somebody can push me one way or the other. That's why okay. I'm. That's why I'm on here. Well, I one thing I'm curious about is where you. It, it sounds like you weren't feeling on the fence at all before. Uh, you know, four months ago, and and now you are, or were you kind of already on the fence before all this happened? I wasn't feeling on the fence before that happened because I thought I'd get a lot more clinic experience. Uh, I'm not. I'm not scared about the business aspect. Uh, I've been in. Uh, I've been sort of uh, managing my older brother's business. He runs. He's an entrepreneur, and he ran multiple businesses. And I've wow. sort of been in the in and out of uh, sort of running a business and all of that. But the whole clinical aspect is what's scaring me now. With uh, not enough experience mm. as we are right now with the whole COVID thing, uh, I think a lot of fourth years are not getting enough experience. Yeah, sure. I mean, that's a that's a common uh, fear that's coming up. You said you were out about four months. Yeah, we were out for about four months. Yeah, I think uh, I we really started back seeing patients, I think, uh, last month. So it was five getting kind of a little bit closer to six. Um, and, and I think that, you know, you bring up a good point about, you know, missing those clinical experiences and potentially not being quite as prepared as you would have been um, coming out as a new grad. And, you know, there were already uh, a lot of preconceptions about new grads not really being prepared for, you know, going into practice like that. Um, in four months didn't exactly help, but, you know, on, on just to kind of play devil's advocate at the same time, I think about like, you know, what really would have gotten done in about four months. And I, I don't know how it is at your school, but personally, like, I, I kind of think about, you know, what I actually get done in four months. I'm like, yeah, most dentists do that in like a week. So I don't really, <laughs> I'm not exactly sure how much it would move the needle. Like I still feel, um, like no matter what you're going to kind of, you know, go into this crucible and it's going to be really fast and you're not going to feel fast enough. You're going to feel overwhelmed for a while. And there's just sort of like a period of, you know, rapid, you know, clinical expansion and, and efficiency and you're getting used to having assistance and stuff. And uh, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't I don't think that's necessarily an invalid concern that you have. But at the same time, I still kind of challenge the idea that we're really that much worse off uh, than we already were if that was technically the case. All right. Yeah. That's why I'm sort of looking for a practice. If I find a great right. opportunity, I'll just dive right in. And like you said, there's always going to be a period of where you just get used to the real world instead of the school of dentistry, like you said. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Yeah. What's uh? So you came to us with uh with an opportunity, correct? Yes. Yeah. So let's uh let's go ahead and kind of explain that to us just on a surface level. Obviously, you don't have to give any way anything that you don't want to, or you think they would give it away, but yeah, just go ahead and give us an overview of where you're at. So this is a uh, practice I found uh, through a broker and uh, the practice is doing close to a million is doing 950 uh, thousand a year. That was uh, 2018 income. Um, the 
doctor works there full time, 40 hours a week, uh, works Monday through Friday. Um, what I saw interesting about the practice is 50, almost 50% of his production comes from hygiene. So I thought even me as a new grad, I can come in and add some, some sort of production in there from the doctor's point of view. So that's what kind of interested me in that practice. So just to kind of give some, some context, um, you know, what, what is it that you were really looking for in an opportunity? What kind of practice do you really have in mind for yourself? You know, what does uh, Morty's practice ultimately look like? So I just want to practice to where I can uh, sort of expand into maybe like two dentists office to where on the long run, I can work part time while having an associate. And if I want, I still don't know if I want to own multiple practices, but I want that idea open for me just in case. And uh, I want to have the practice to where I can come in and uh, do all the things that the doctor is doing, maybe in a couple in a year or so I can add more procedures to sort of uh, grow the practice up to, to bar. Okay. So it kind of sounds like what you have in mind is a group practice. Is right. that what I'm gathering from that? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So what kind of, I mean, I understand that, you know, you, you see the benefits of going into group practices, you know, having some time off and being able to have an associate and having a little bit more flexibility there. Um, can you kind of give us a little bit of background as to, you know, how you arrived at that? Like, do you have any you know, ideas about where you see yourself in say maybe five, 10 years in terms of, you know, being clinical within the practice, actually working in the practice. Do you see yourself being an absentee owner? Like, do you have visions of that or, or, you know, where I, are you at with that? I do. In about 10 years, I see myself working less clinically and more focused on the business aspect of the practice. I enjoy doing clinical dentistry, but I don't see myself doing it for until like I'm 50, 60. I want to mm -hmm. have the opportunity to get out if I needed to and focus on the business aspect, if that's what I would want. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I guess what I'm gathering is that you'll kind of do the clinical dentistry as long as it's enjoyable. And then there will come, uh, ass assuming there's going to be a junction in your life where you say, yeah, I'm kind of ready to step back from this. And, you know, I just want to be a business owner. Exactly. I don't want to be forced to do clinical dentistry just because the practice can't function without me, but mm -hmm. I want to be able to do it on my own terms. Yeah, you know, I, I hear you 100% on that. Um, so in trying to find an opportunity, did you have sort of a, a particular archetype of a practice that you had in mind? Like, did you know how many ops you'd be looking for? Or what kind of options you want to be working with? I was looking for a minimum of four ops, five uh, to seven was the uh, number that I was looking at practice that's producing about okay. at least over 800 because I didn't want to buy too small of a practice that won't end up growing. Looking at the small practices, they only had like three operatories, four operatories, and I wanted to have a practice mm -hmm. where I can expand. I think this practice has five ops, but it can be expanded to seven ops if needed. Yeah, that definitely okay. that definitely sounds pretty decent. I feel like for two doctors, I feel like you'd at least want to be in the six to eight range, eight probably sure. being more ideal. Because um, yeah, I feel like you'll figure out sooner than not, you're going to be running out of space and wishing you had more. Right. Absolutely. Right. So, so tell me a little bit. Um, you mentioned that you would have potential to expand to seven ops. Could you go further than that? I mean, what kind of you know building we're we talking about? Is it like standalone professional building? It's a standalone, but I think it's uh, it's pretty easy to expand to uh, seven ops because there's two uh, two ops that are pumped already, but they're not they're not full operatories yet. So it could be easily expanded to seven. But I think it, with like okay. some uh, some work, it can expand to more. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, that's, that's fair enough. Um, so tell me a little bit, you know, this is a challenge that myself and, and Peyton are currently dealing with. So you're a fourth year dental student and there's a lot of fourth year dental students that listen to this podcast and they are probably trying to set their eyes on some practices, just like the one you found, or, you know, maybe something a little bit different, but they run in different obstacles when trying to find opportunities as a student. How did you come across this opportunity? So I, uh, actually, uh, used, uh, DDS Match, uh, which is a broker that basically yeah. works for the seller more than the buyer, but then they advertise different practices that are on there. I got in touch with the uh, broker that works in the area that I want to live in, and uh, I gave him a call and told him about my story, told him that I was a fourth year yeah. down student up front, and uh, told him that I was looking for a practice to buy in, and I was open to the idea of maybe uh, 
having a one year mentorship and then buying right after and just okay. told him my vision for the future basically. And he told me that I might run into some issues with uh, financing and stuff like that. But he mm-hmm. said, we'll talk about that as, as we find a practice. Okay. Yeah. Fair enough. So is, is that the only route you went through? Um, actually just contacting a broker, you know, in your fourth year, or did you entertain some other routes? Well, I'm, I'm in the process of, uh, making a mailer actually and sending okay. it to multiple practices but if this practice don't pay through i i'll probably go through that route because uh i've already started compiling a list of different dentists in my area that are over the age of 60 and i'll probably send them a bunch of mailers and see what pans out through that with my contact information see if anybody contacts me okay yeah sure so you mentioned uh location so are you kind of already in the location that you hope to be longer term or Right now, I'm not. I'm uh, I'm going to school out of state, but okay. I know that I want to go back to where I used to be. So hopefully, move okay. back. Yeah, fair enough. So, do you have like kind of a large uh, radius that you're looking across? You would you be mailing to you know several hundred offices, or is it kind of a constrained space? It's it's more constrained than that. It's more of a like a count like several counties within the state and uh, okay. mailing to area. I don't. Uh, Preference of mine, I don't want to end up being in a two role of an area that's uh, over two hours away from a, a metropolitan. So okay. I'm sort of limiting my search to those areas. That still okay. that still gives you plenty to work with, though. I mean, two hours outside of a metro gives you plenty, and I mean, especially if you want to live closer to town and commute out, that's totally an option. So I, I think you're more than okay with that search criteria, because I'm. Uh, I'm looking like much more closer to town. Like I, I definitely want to be like closer to the city center. And there was still plenty. I, uh, I just sent out my mailer the other day, actually, and there was still plenty of opportunities, um, or potential opportunities, closer to the city. So I think you'd be totally fine with that. Okay, that's nice. To yeah, Peyton just had to plug his mailer in here. Just had to. That was his end. I don't. <laughs> uh, Morty, have you seen Peyton's mailer? A chance i think i have i don't know if, I, if that's the one i'm using i'm using the one that uh as a sample uh-huh. the one i found on the uh shared practices website actually yeah yeah no you you haven't seen peyton's mailer you would okay, know if not Payton, that was um, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah he take a look at Payton's mailer then no it, it it is something else it looks like a gq magazine actually oh, that's wow. actually yeah that's what i'm kind of worried about is that people are going to look at it and not and not know that it came from a student and they, they're going to be like designed it. this is commercial and just throw it in the trash exactly we're hoping we can exactly. avoid that but yeah for sure yeah but you know just as a note go ahead and check that out morning because it's pretty cool all right um, I'll definitely will yeah i'm pretty i'm pretty envious of it i was pretty proud of my mailer until uh until Payton's came out and now I'm humbled to say the <laughs> least. Yeah. I kind of just want to make a magazine for my own pleasure. So uh, what's that? I'll see if I can take some inspiration from it. Then. Oh yeah, for sure. You know, Peyton might be able to help you out with that. Um, but yeah, so it, the, the main reason that I bring that up is, you know, being that you're looking for a larger practice or one that could potentially be grown into a larger practice. Um, it can be very difficult, um, ask me how I know, to find larger practices in a more constrained area. You know, for me, um, I was really looking, uh, I mean, really, this isn't even that small of an area, but I was looking about 30, 45 minutes circumferential to Atlanta. Um, and, you know, I didn't get a whole lot back. I mean, there, I mean, I was able to send to a, a fair number of group practices. Um, but at the same time, like when you're when you already have your eyes set on a larger practice, it's really important. I, you know, I'm not trying to incentivize people to be more flexible about where they want to live because that's what's important. I mean, that's that comes first. But it, it is tough to find these larger practices. They really only represent, you know, maybe 10 percent of dental practices on the whole. So, um, you know, I, I still invite you to do that mailer and, and see what comes of it. Um, but at the same time, I do think you found an interesting opportunity already. Yeah, yeah. I've, uh, I've been trying to look at different opportunities through brokers, but like you said, it's very yeah. hard to kind of find that practice that you have in mind, especially if you're constrained to a specific area that you want to practice in. Yeah. And, and another thing that's that's very relevant to you know what's going on now, of course, is uh, in the conversations I've had um, with brokers and also some dental lenders, there's just not really a whole lot of transitions going on right now. Um, just because of all the uncertainty about what's going to happen in Q3, Q4. Um, have you run into any friction with that? And do, do you feel like there's, you know, some hesitance on uh, on the broker's part about I have, practice lineup for you? 
Yeah, a lot of yeah. the brokers that I've been trying to talk to, they, were, uh, they sort of had this idea that I needed to be pre-approved before they show me any of their listings because, like you said, right now it's kind of getting hard to get approved from lenders because of the mm-hmm. whole COVID thing. And uh, I know lenders are requiring more of a down payment now than they used to for the practice. You know, I I actually I, I kind of take issue with the whole pre-approval thing. Um, I ran into that wall uh, a couple times when I was uh, when I was looking through through different practices, mostly through brokers, is where you know people would bring it up. And when I talked to a dental specific lender in my area, I was talking to them about pre-approval, and I was like, "Hey, I mean, how important is this? And you know, how do I get started?" And they basically told me, "Hey, honestly, that." That doesn't mean anything to us, <laughs> you know, like being pre-approved for a loan, especially when you're going through a dental specific lender that knows how to look at a practice and like really tell whether or not um, it's a viable transition for you. That doesn't mean a whole lot because um, and, and this is something we talk about on the show all the time. It depends on the opportunity that you have as to how viable it is. It's not, you know, just a, a your credit score. Or something right? right like it's it's your ability to produce as a dentist or uh, as a new grad whatever the case may be um and and ultimately like the cash flow and the health of the practice that you're buying out what the transition is going to look like what the procedure mix is like dental lenders understand those things and and pre-approval doesn't really mean a whole lot to them and and what they end up telling me is hey we just want to see whatever practice you find and and we'll talk about it then pre-approval doesn't really mean a whole lot so that, it's interesting that you run into that. Yeah, that's sort of the same thing I've gone from. Uh, I tried to talk to like the same way that you did to a uh, dental specific lender, and I've gotten the same sort of message. Right. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, I, I I think they have a better understanding of it, and sometimes I wonder if that's just like a, a wall that gets thrown up um, to, to you know to dental students that are looking for practices to say, hey, you need to be pre approved, knowing that most of the people they're looking for pre approval at that stage are not necessarily going to have um you know the best looking situation while being in school and and not really having a whole lot of credit perhaps um you know because they're younger or or whatever um yeah so that that's a curious and and somewhat frustrating thing that i know people run into but i I hope that you know people listening to this do not run into that and think oh i can't do this because i'm not pre-approved um that's that's kind of an invisible barrier that i'm not too convinced by Yeah. yeah so yeah i know that's a bit of a tangent um Okay, so yeah, let, let's get into uh, this practice a little bit more. I mean, how much do you really know about it? Like, I you've sent us the financials over and, and ran the whole spreadsheet and everything, but how do you feel? Uh, so far, what I know is what you guys know the financials. I haven't signed any non uh, any uh, letter of intent yet, and I haven't talked yeah. to the actual owner. So far, I've been just talking to the broker, and he's been sort of the mediator between us. Um, um, I have a plan to go and actually visit the practice and see it in person. Uh, pretty soon here but that, uh, okay. that's about what i have is the financials that i've sent okay so i mean what is it that you're you're kind of looking for you know in this conversation like do you have some some hesitance about what you found i mean what's uh you know i, I guess i'm what i'm asking is why have you come to us because it really to be honest it kind of seems like you have your bearing straight kind of so uh looking at the financials uh i started thinking about what the financials would look if i was to take over the practice and uh okay. it would be one more dentist coming in because the owner wants to work part-time still and that would be beneficial for me to have somebody work part-time and help helpfully guide me and transition the patients and that would act an ex- that would add an extra cost to the practice and uh i think mm-hmm. the owner owns the office and i would be renting it so that would add an extra cost to the spreadsheet as well and Mm -hmm. also the practice loans and my student loans so i was just wondering if that opportunity would be viable with all the extra expenses that i'm bringing in yeah yeah i feel like you you definitely have to look at a, a bunch of different things um did he tell you exactly how long he was planning on working part time is it gonna be a couple years or is it gonna be like 10 what I've been told is as long as he's needed, he does not want to work that long, but he's willing to work for two years, two to three years max. Okay. So it's, it's kind of up to you as far as right. how long he sticks around. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. That's, I feel like that's definitely very favorable considering your situation being a new grad. Uh, as far as um, new patient flow and just the size of the practice overall, I know you brought up the high hygiene percentage. Uh, do you feel like there's enough patients to support two doctors in there with the patient flow that he has now at 
seems unlikely. I don't think he advertises very much. So hopefully with advertising, I don't know how many patients we could bring in extra. Okay. Yeah, twenty patients um, per month. Okay. Is the is the practice in a good spot? Is it visible? Is it a high traffic street? What? Just kind of give us some more details on that. It's it's in a visible spot. It's in a high traffic street. It's uh, more towards a, a rural area, and there's not a lot of diff other practices next to it, so that's a plus. Um, uh, there's a, he has almost I think around five thousand patients, four thousand something active patients in the practice uh the uh, i would be very skeptical about that yeah because yeah, I'm, I'm with tyler on that <laughs> just too saying. Okay. just saying <laughs> no, i believe I, that many patients have been through the practice i don't i'm not sure about active but active. go ahead oh. that's fine <laughs> oh yeah i'll uh yeah. i know that the doctor is advertising a lot of different procedures on his website like invisalign uh extraction and sure. but he doesn't to see he doesn't seem to be doing a lot of them so i don't know if it's uh a doctor thing mm -hmm. or the patient's population that he has don't need those procedures. Mm -hmm. I, I, I will tell you this. Um, I have found that in a lot of dental websites, and I don't know what this person's website actually looks like, but um, you will see advertisements for different dental procedures. Um, and sometimes those are procedures that they actually refer out. It's just sort of something that they add, um, I guess, for like an SEO type of mm -hmm. thing. Like you'll see like the, there's... I've seen several pages that look totally identical about dental implants and you read into it and it's just totally boilerplate. They didn't read it and it doesn't look like they actually place them. They just restore them. Okay. Um, so it looks like the practice is doing implants, but really that's just something that's on the website. Um, so that's something, you know, this is one of the reasons we like to see the uh, uh, ADA production um, by procedure code report. So we can kind of actually get a little bit better of a breakdown for that. And you did actually send us something over. Um, it was actually kind of interesting. It looks like a, a histogram or something like that, that, that shows the uh, breakdown of procedures. Is that right? Did you send me that my way? Yeah. It's a breakdown of the 10 top procedures, basically that the top 10 okay. procedures of the practice and the top three, I think were either the ex exams, uh, hygiene and crowns with exam okay. in the majority of the income coming in through the practice. Did yeah. you see anything in that report that would be a point of concern for you as far as like procedure you don't know how to do or anything like that? No, not necessarily. More of a thinking that there'd be more room for me to do more procedures seeing that most of his income comes from hygiene and he doesn't seem to be doing more than bread and butter dentistry. Very rarely that he does like a, an extraction or he does uh, uh, restoring an implant or something like that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I was gonna say if he if he did do some more advanced procedures, you know, molar endo, placing implants, that kind of thing, it would be nice to have him around and hopefully he could teach you. Um, but if he doesn't do that stuff, that's fine for you too, just because, you know, being a new grad, you don't have a ton of experience with those things. Um, but you could obviously take C E and learn those skills, you know, as the time comes and you as you feel like it's fit. All right. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, for sure. So do you don't happen to have any of those things in your wheelhouse by now, uh, as a D4, would you? No, we just, just started <laughs> you know, the whole COVID thing. Uh, yeah. didn't start Indo till pretty recently. I mean, I've been doing mm. quite a few extractions, but not third okay. or anything crazy. Yeah. Uh, you never know, man. There's some dental students out there that are uh, kind of CE junkies. They know a lot about that kind of stuff, but yeah, yeah. we have um, a couple of those in our class. Yeah, sure. Of course. Um, yeah. So like, I mean, you know, I, I'm looking at it and, you know, one thing you mentioned is that there is a very high hygiene production ratio. And this is something that I would certainly want to get verified. Um, but it is right around 49%. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of dentistry to be had here. And the person uh, that is currently in that office is not either diagnosing it or having it accepted one way or another. Um, it, honestly, this practice is kind of just like really begging to have an associate or something in there. Um, you know, if I were an owner in that situation and, you know, provided there's uh, enough ops that, a, that an associate should come in and, and be able to run. And I said, I think it said a five plus two is basically what this is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the, the patient flow is there. I assume the recall volume is there. Um, I would want to get a little bit more information about that, um, you know, as to what the uh, reappointment percentage is and, you know, what the real actual active patient count is. Um, to get an understanding of that, but the hygiene ratio, uh, that kind of speaks for itself. And there certainly is, you know, room, 
uh, for a new grad to come in there and, and uh, make some messes. Right. And I feel like uh, I can spend some money on advertising to get more patients in because I think he spends around five to four thousand a year on advertising only. Yeah, practically nothing. Yeah, yeah practically nothing. Yeah. And he just brings in 20 patients a month. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is actually a, this is a topic that came up um, with our coaching program um, just uh, the other night. Was it last night? Yeah, it was. Um, we were talking about, you know, sort of what the baseline new patient flow is and calibrating that against what is currently being spent on marketing. And uh, what you see here is you got 20 new patients a month and they're spending about 1% um, of the overhead on marketing. And, you know, really that's practically nothing. A lot of that is just kind of relying on street visibility and, you know, word of mouth, internal referral, you know, whatever's going on, whatever that practice is doing, it's already got 20. Um, generally per doctor, we like to see about 25 new patients per month. Um, so if you're planning on ultimately having two full-time, uh, doctors in that practice, you want to get closer to 50, but you know, there's, there's definitely some, uh, some low hanging fruit there. You know, we don't know about how the phone system is handled. We don't know how the calls are coming in and being screened and whether or not people are being appointed for that. Um, and, and being that it already has a baseline of 20 with almost nothing really going on, I would say it's somewhat encouraging. Um, right. you know, there's definitely going to have to be some marketing efforts there and, and some effort to, to make this thing grow. But I really got a feeling that this, this Dennis has not been looking for new patients, um, you know, too ardently for some time. All right. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, okay. So have we learned anything new about this practice? Is there anything that you've heard us say so far that you kind of didn't already expect? I um, mean, you know, I'm hearing a lot of positive things, mostly, uh, stuff right. from firm, what I've already had in mind, but I just wanted other people to sort of nudge mm -hmm. in the right direction. Cause like I said, I've sort of been hesitant with the whole, uh, uh, situation going on right now and seeing a lot of my classmates going the corporate route or going the mm -hmm. uh, uh, the route of uh, having one year of uh, residency instead of going straight out into like private practice. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I, I kind of have to probe a little bit here, Morty, because uh, you seem like a guy that has a pretty good handle on the situation and like kind of understands the opportunity that you're looking at. And you seem like you pretty much have a pretty solid plan of how you would go in there and kind of make it this into like Morty's ideal practice. Um, but all of a sudden there's this kind of hesitation that's come about in like four months of being away from um, clinical dentistry. And it's like somehow uh, the plan has changed for you and you're not feeling as solid about what you're going to do. And I'm a little bit curious as, as to, you know, how that resonates with you. I think honestly, it's sort of uh, just a little bit of fear from me graduating very soon. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah actually doing it for real instead of just been thinking yeah. about it for a couple of years it's actually the doing yeah. it right now and and honestly i think that had covid never happened like if, if 2020 weren't such a crazy year you'd probably still feel that way right yeah I think um i think that's a very common feeling <laughs> because you know i i think as as much as we can grow to despise being in dental school um dental school is kind of a womb you know and you know, when you're treating patients within the the dental student clinic, uh, you're very insulated from a lot of the real world problems that happen in private practice, a lot of the liability that can happen. Um, there's always someone over your shoulder that's got years of experience and like answers whenever you kind of run into something you're not all that familiar with, or you don't really want to be pulling out your iPad and your notability app and looking through PowerPoints to figure out what you're supposed to do in this situation, right? And then there's this idea that you're going to go out and everyone is like, oh, this is Dr. Morty now. And Dr. Morty knows exactly what needs to be done for this. And that generates fear. And I think that plays into people's decision making always. I, I don't think it, I don't even think it has as much to do with 2020. I really don't. I, I think that's why a lot of people kind of end up going the corporate route. There are good and bad reasons for that. Um, but I, I think the fear is something people need to understand a little bit better to kind of make some more clear decision making. Right. Honestly, uh, that resonates with me very much because, uh, like you said, yeah. it's always the fear of what if I mess up and I don't have anybody to help me. Yeah. Out. In dental school, you always have somebody over your shoulders that's willing to come and help you out as soon as you uh, make a mistake or as soon as you mess up. Yeah. I mean, what what better to make you to you know feel a little bit more comforted? about, you know, just kind of being put out into the real world and having to be an actual dentist that, you know, um, people expect to know what they're doing, um, than to know that there's going to be somebody over your shoulder 
checking your preps or, <laughs> or, or your matrix band or whatever. Yeah. Right. And I, I, I just, what, I, what I'm trying to confide is that, you know, I feel that way too. Like I, you know, I haven't worked in, in private practice. I haven't even been able to do an external rotation yet. Um, I can thank COVID for that, but you know, I haven't really had a whole lot of experiences where I was in the seat and I was a doctor and everyone around me was just looking, you know, for answers as to what we were about to do. That's an intimidating situation for anybody. And I think you incorporate, you, you encounter that wherever you go. Um, maybe if you go to a residency, you still have somewhat of a, a, you know, someone standing over you a little bit, but for the most part, like this is what you're up against and it's what you signed up for. And I think identifying that journey as it is and not really letting that come in the way of the goal that you have made is an important thing that people need to do. Like I, 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 I worry about people backing down from the goals that they've had for so long because of that fear that really everyone shares. And that's sort of what I've been running into. I didn't want that fear to affect my decision making. So I was, yeah. I told myself if I find the right opportunity, I'm going for it. I'm not just, I'm not going to take a, tell myself, oh, maybe you should wait a year. Maybe you should wait two years. There are other <laughs> opportunities that would come along. But I told myself, yeah. if I the right opportunity, I'll go for it. Yeah, for sure, man. And look, like, I'm not encouraging people to just jump the gun on the first thing that comes their way. By no means. Like, yeah. you still need to weigh your options. You know, do the mailer. Like, do as much as you can and, like, uh, you know, uncover as many opportunities as you can. And then you compare them and see what's going to be best for Dr. Morty's practice. You know, like, I'm not telling you, you got to, like, go straight into it. <laughs> Um, but, but I think you got to double down on, on what you said you're doing this for. I mean, you're somebody that's been listening to share practices since the first year. I mean, you've been listening as long as I have, right? Like you're ready to go, man. I, I mean, I can, I can see it in you. You've been, you know, running your, your brother's practice, uh, sorry, not practices, but businesses. You have all this experience. Like, I think you can handle this. I think so too. I just needed a little bit of encouragement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, you know, if that, if that's all we can offer, like, that's cool, man. That's good. Um, so I guess to kind of like bring things around, like how, how, how are you going to, you know, move into this opportunity from, from here forward? What's, what's your next move here? So my next move is to actually go and see the practice in person. So hopefully by the end of this month, uh, I would have seen the practice and, uh, hopefully actually try to talk to the doctor. Maybe I'll need to sign a letter of intent or something in order mm-hmm. for the broker to, get us in touch. So I want to talk to the doctor and see what's going on with those numbers. What's going on with the high hygiene numbers. Mm-hmm. Is it a not diagnosing? Is it referring or is it just the patient population? Mm-hmm. Stuff like that. I just want to confirm stuff that I've seen on the spreadsheet. Yeah. Um, I think that's a good plan. I mean, I, I think the first thing is like, you really haven't met this person yet. Mm-hmm. Um, you don't know what their real timeline is. You kind of just hear it secondhand from the broker. Right. Um, you know, you've got to really figure out where they're at, what they would be like to work with and kind of make it make sense for Dr. Morty. You know what I mean? Like, don't look at this person as, you know, someone that's going to be, you know, potentially coddling you within the practice or, you know, kind of still running the show, even though technically they don't own it. Like you, you got to be careful about how you regard this person and make sure that they're aligning with you mentally and make sure that they can understand that even though you're a student, you're not your typical student and they should be your you know, respecting you like a doctor and like someone that's going to be owning the practice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then from there, this it's, you're right. It's due diligence. Like you got to really do a deep dive, get in these numbers and, and verify things and make sure that, you know, this is what you're looking at. I mean, I would say that, you know, I would be pretty enthused by a practice like this. If I found it, um, you know, personally, as Peyton was alluding to earlier, um, I like practices that are a little bit larger in terms of operatories off the bat. Um, but that doesn't necessarily preclude this from being, you know, a path to getting to a larger practice. Right. Yeah. And, and I think you pretty much understand how that works, you know, taking the practice from where it is to where it goes. So have you kind of thought about, I mean, that timeline of like getting it to that, you know, I think you said seven, eight op practice. Yeah. I think I want to take it to at least a seven op practice. Hopefully uh, mm-hmm. after the, uh, the, uh, older dentist retires and moves out of the practice. Hopefully the practice is, if I can get the practice to grow big enough to handle two full-time dentists, then I'll start expanding into t- to those two extra optories and get another dentist in and hopefully grow it to where I can work and another dentist can work in there full-time. I know yeah. this is kind of assuming, like assuming things go through. Um, were you guys planning on working at the same time when 
because I feel like five ops with two docks is, is going to be really tight for you. So I don't think that we'd be working at the same time. Uh, we haven't talked about it much at all. You'd probably be working like maybe two, three days, a, two days a week at most because he's, he's trying to retire as soon as possible. He's just willing to be part time just to help the transition of the patients. Yeah, because yeah, kind of what I was getting at with that is I, I almost feel like you'd want to expand sooner than you're thinking. Uh, right. I feel like just to utilize that space, and especially if the hygiene ratio and just the amount of patients that the practice has is as high as you think they are, I feel like you're going to be needing that space much sooner than you anticipate. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. 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 So I, I, I definitely think if, it, like, like I said, if you do decide to go through with this, I feel like adding those ops will be a, a sooner rather than later. Okay. And I'll keep that in mind. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, if, if you're, you know, feeling particularly concerned about being at the office by yourself, um, I think that's going to be happening right out the gate here because there's really not a whole lot of room for two uh, full-time dentists to be there. Yeah, with the five ops, especially two ops are for, uh, I think three ops are for hygiene. So it's just two ops for doctors. So Yeah, so you don't you wouldn't happen to know um, how many hygienists are on the payroll or how many hygiene days there are currently? I think there are three hygienists on the payroll. Okay. All full-time? Yeah. Uh, I think two full-time, one part-time. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and and I guess the office is open four days a week? It's open five days a week. Uh, five days a week. Five. Okay. And that was one yeah. of the things that uh, I don't, I, for me personally, I want to be open four days a week, more than five days a week. Mm-hmm. I don't know how the transition is going to be between, uh, to transition it down to just four days a week. Yeah. Well, I mean, the, the problem with it is, is that, you know, you already have so many hygiene days, like you got a lot of hygienists and, you know, they're probably pretty booked out here and, uh, there's going to be issues, um, with trying to get these patients scheduled, um, in time, because there's going to be a whole lot getting diagnosed now that there's going to try and be, you know, you want to have like two doctors in place. And so, um, you know, the problem is that this is, uh, a seed or a plant that is growing a little bit too fast for the base that it's contained within. Um, at least that's that's kind of what you're getting into here. And so I really do think that, you know, your first uh, priority is going to be figuring out how can I expand um, the capacity here as quickly as possible. And that's something you need to be looking at when you go into this practice and, and you know, figure out how, you know, ready to go those plumbed ops are, right? And like just, just what's really going to have to happen um, on day one, you know, getting into that or maybe even before, before you actually go into the practice. That might be something to consider. And, um, I, I am also curious, you know, who do you kind of have in your corner, you know, going through this whole process? Like, is it just you or do you have like a mentor or something that's kind of guiding you through this? Or? Uh, it's basically just me so far. I've uh, been yeah. kind of getting the advice from my older brother since he's, but he's, he doesn't have a lot of experiences with the dental field. So sort yeah. of on the business side, but on the dental side is basically just me. Yeah. Um, so being that you're an avid listener of the Share Practices podcast, would you uh, possibly see the value in having a, a professional within the dental field that's going to kind of be there for you to to kind of help you through this process and understand how everything needs to be uh, sequenced, so to speak? Definitely. Yeah, I actually yeah. <laughs> that's, that's okay. I'm very interested in. So, Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so shameless plug here. I have to. Um, you know, honestly, you need to go into due diligence and have someone in your corner like that principally is important. And that's what I want you to come away with. Um, but of course, share practices, uh, offers a lot of those types of services starting with due diligence. Um, so, uh, I think you should stay, stay in touch with us and we'll get you hooked up with Suzanne Rassi. And, uh, you know, it, it provided this whole meeting with the doctor goes really well and you're not picking up any red flags. Um, we can start getting through this process and, and, um, you know, see what we can do with this practice and see how quickly we can get to Dr. Morty's ideal practice. Definitely. Yeah. Cause as soon as, uh, as when I was talking with, uh, George through email, uh, he either was said, are you a hundred percent on this practice? If you are, maybe we should put you with, uh, with our coaching department, or if you want to mm-hmm. we'll talk more about it, he'll put me with you. So I think this is the first step. If I'm yeah. really hundred percent on that practice, then I'll definitely need the guidance. I think. Yeah, no, I, I couldn't agree more, obviously. Uh, Peyton, you got anything? Yeah, I, I I feel like no matter how much you listen, how much you listen to the show, how much research you do, it's still really nice to have someone talking you through it because mm-hmm. lots of times I feel like you kind of look at it through like uh, like heart-shaped goggles or heart-shaped glasses. Is that a, what a, you know, you know what, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so like you. <laughs> what is the Elton John with the heart-shaped yeah, goggles? I mean, it's just how it is. <laughs> 
think it's, I think you're looking for rose colored glasses. That's it. That's the one. So you knew what I meant. <laughs> Anyways, no matter how much you consume this content, it's nice to have someone to talk to that's not. <laughs> I'm losing it. I'm sorry. Go it's, ahead. I'm uh, so sorry. It's someone that's not emotionally invested in the process. Um, someone that can just look at your opportunity objectively and say, this is what's good. This is what's not. And tell you just mm-hmm. who you need where. Because, I mean, at some point, you'll need an attorney. At some point, you need an accountant. So mm-hmm. just knowing where all those pieces fit in, I feel like, is where having a coach to kind of coach you through it is it really is important. So I think that's something you would benefit from greatly. I yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that hundred percent and sorry to cut you off Morty. I mean, uh, you know, I think you are someone that's, that's very well, um, studied on this whole process. Um, but Peyton's right. You know, that why would you necessarily try to DIY this? You know, why would you invite the risk of you forgetting something or doing something out of sequence and, you know, having that on, you know, your own hands. I mean, um, I think you understand that like having someone in your corner and that's been through it a million times is going to be your best shot at getting this done right and most efficiently and, you know, getting you in that spot and that sort of ideal vision that you have um, as soon as possible. So, um, yeah, but, you know, to kind of circle back, like I, I just want to acknowledge you for, you know, coming into this conversation totally blind, not knowing exactly what to expect and having a pretty awesome practice here to show um, and, you know, having that vision and having the experience and, you know, having the, the gall to say, you know what, I'm a fourth year dental student and I'm looking to have a practice when I graduate. I mean, there's just, it's just not that common, man. So yeah. well, hopefully you're trying to live the dream. Yeah and, yeah. and on top of that being vulnerable too. I mean, there's a lot of people that oh, be like, sure. Oh, I'm not scared. Like I'm not scared, but like deep down there, like it's, it's yeah. killing them. So I, I really appreciate you showing that on this too. I think that's really important for a lot of people to see, you know, a lot of people will see a success story and be like, oh, it's all, you know, sunshine and rainbows, but mm-hmm. they don't see the flip side of the coin. So I, I really appreciate you for acknowledging that and talking with us about that today. Yeah, I really appreciate having the conversation. It really helps. Yeah, awesome. So um, I'm really, you know, invested in your story here and I want to, you know, see and hear where it goes. So, you know, we'll get you, uh, you let me know how that office visit goes and, you know, we'll get this process going. And, um, you know, hopefully it may be, I don't know, six to eight months or so. We'll kind of check back in and see how things are going and, and we'll kind of see this practice take off. One thing I really, really want to start doing with this segment is like actually following through on the people that, you know, end up purchasing practices and just seeing how it goes, especially, um, you know, D four is like yourself and, and, and me, of course, and just seeing how that, all that goes and how the whole chair practices philosophies are applied. Um, I think it's going to be really interesting. Hopefully I'll definitely stay in touch. Yep. All right, Morty. Well, we sure appreciate it, man. Uh, thank you so much. I really appreciate the interview. All right. See you, bud. Yeah. All right. So as you guys can see, um, he definitely is very still invested in buying a practice. And it's it's very refreshing to see, uh, especially being a D4 um, with this situation that he's in, um, just with COVID and everything. He's still very committed to his goal that he set. And I, I think that's definitely something that's very admirable. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, I was kind of happy that we – that, that he was so willing to sort of go into the subject of, you know, why he became hesitant all of a sudden. Right. Um, because, you know, he's this guy that, you know, had this plan. He was work, he was reaching out to to brokers and he was trying to find a practice. And then, you know, COVID happens, he loses like four months. And then he says, Oh, well, I'm not sure if I want to do this anymore. Maybe I should go work for corporate or, you know, I, I got to go just get a job somewhere or something like that. Right. Like that's a very like common thing to do, but he was able to kind of recognize that like right off the bat and say, yeah, I think that is kind of happening. But when you kind of turn the focus and say, you know, is it really about like, I'm not ready for practice ownership or is it more like maybe I'm just not ready to be a doctor. Right. I'm not ready to be fully autonomous. I'm not, I I don't know how to do everything that comes in to the clinic. Like, you know, I, I saw this patient today and they had this problem and I have no clue how to approach it. How am I ever like, what if I see this in, in private practice and I don't know what I'm doing? Like, what do I do? Right. So like we get caught up in the house. Right. And that creates fear for us. And if we don't sort of identify that and and analyze it and really understand where it's coming from and sort of identify that it's probably going to be there no matter what we do, um, you know, what can happen is it starts to kind of affect our actual plans. And that's where we really lose. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think fear. Um, it's always going to be there. It's always going to be there. Uh, It might not be in the same things, um, but you just kind of have to learn how to not let it take over and kind of control. You need to be able to look at it objectively and say, okay, this is causing me fear. 
why is it causing me fear and what can I do mm-hmm. to overcome it? Uh, I think that's a really, really important skill, not just for practice ownership, but just for life in mm-hmm. general. I mean, there's going to be conversations that are hard. There's going to be times that are hard. Yeah. And just being able to look at them as objectively as you can and figure out what the best way is to move past it, I think is super, super important. Yeah. And, and another thing about that fear is like fear never really goes away. You know, even once you have that practice and maybe you find out it wasn't quite as bad as you thought it was going to be, you're still going to be afraid of some things, right? There's still going to be, maybe you're afraid to uh, tell a patient they need a crown um, because, you know, you're afraid that they're, they're going to balk at you and think you're ripping them off or something like that. Like fear is a persistent feeling and we kind of have to be able to uh, contextualize it and sequester it and say, okay, like, Fear's a natural response. It's 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 I don't need to sit here and like try and bury it. Like it's something I've had um, you know, since before I even got into dental school. Like what was I I mean, I I think back to, you know, when this whole dental school journey kind of started, you know, what I was afraid of uh back in the beginning, it was the DAT. That was the scariest thing in the world. Like I was way more scared of that than I don't know, something that's like legitimately scary and not just a standardized test, right? Like <laughs> um you know, and, and that fear, it sticks with you through every step of this process. And you're going to be afraid about selling your practice one day. And you're going to be afraid about making sure you get your money's worth or, you know, what if you miss it after it's gone? And you're like, oh my God, I don't have a practice anymore. Like there's always going to be negating thoughts and fears throughout this journey. It's just a part of it. And it doesn't mean that your journey has to change because you encounter it. Yeah. I'm, I'm so glad that we're bringing this up now because I feel like yeah. Through the early stages of the podcast, it was very factual. It was very material. It wasn't super kind of hands-on and like emotional things that you encounter. Um, So I'm glad they're really bringing this up now because I feel like it's something that needs to be addressed for sure. Yeah, because I mean, we can like beat a dead horse and keep talking about hygiene production and, uh, you know, all these different metrics and stuff. But one thing I've come to understand is that our audience knows a lot of stuff about metrics and how to analyze practices and stuff. And, you know, we have these people come on and it's like, they kind of already know these things before you tell them and people listening kind of already know that too. And so I I think it's really, it it serves our audience, especially the ones that have have been around a little bit longer to kind of dive into the things that people aren't always so uh, forthcoming about. And that's, you know, what's really going on in people's minds as they're trying to um, encounter these, these, you know, obstacles in life and in their careers. And I think the the relatability and understanding that, you know, all of us encounter those sorts of things and it's part of the process and being able to embrace that just like you do due diligence or deal finding or whatever is a, is a really empowering thing. So I'm glad we're doing it. Absolutely. Couldn't have said it better myself. I'm sure you could. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But anyway, yeah, this was a really fun episode. I'm looking forward to having more of them. And um, I'm kind of glad that you're starting to kind of take the driver's seat here. It's it's nice to see. It's it's happening, whether I like it or not. (laughs) Just just kidding. I I do. I do like it. Yeah. 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 Just to kind of give people an idea of the sequence. So TPO, it's Tyler and it's Peyton. And then it's somebody that we haven't found yet whose name starts with an O. So we're kind of transitioning into the P now. So yeah. we'll kind of see. Yeah, ex- exactly. exactly. <laughs> All right, everybody. Well, we really appreciate it. Hope you really enjoyed this episode and uh, want to hear more like it because we got more coming down the pipe.